Um, so we're going to start with just a, a, a story or two um, just to get us moving into today's topic. Are you ready for a story? Okay, so um, I'm going to do one of those stories where um, I did something somewhat foolish. Um, anyway, one of those. Uh, I'm hedge trimming the bushes in my yard. Do you ever hedge trim? You ever work with a hedge trimmer? You know what's beautiful about it? You've got kind of a handle here, and then there's like this wand of wonderful cutting power that's there. It's kind of like a lightsaber without the light. You know what I'm saying? And so you can go out, and it's a bit of a suburban dream come true. You can go out to your bushes, and you can shape them to be exactly what you want, and you can just get that thing going. And when I was young, I used to just kind of get that thing going. And I'm just hacking and slashing and doing everything that I want to do, right? And I'm shaping all these bushes to be exactly the way I want to be, but I'm holding it with one hand. And some of you know that's a mistake. The reason is, is because at some point you're going to get tempted to grab a branch and then do this, which I did. And a few stitches later, and I think a tetanus shot, I was healing again. Here's the thing. I had to learn through pain and through some blood and some medical bills. I had to learn two hands on the handle. Amen? Amen. You learned something at church already today. Um, now let's go to plumbing. Um, I remember in, in our first kind of real house, um, I had to switch out some toilets. You ever had to switch out a toilet? Um, one of the things that they tell you when you go to um, tighten down any bolt to a to a toilet is they say, don't over tighten. Yeah. There's a reason they say that because I over tightened. And when you put the stool back down and, and you bring the bolts up through and, and, and the wing nuts are going down and you're tightening it, it too much, do you know what'll happen? You'll break the porcelain. It just cracks and there's no way to fix it. You have to buy a new toilet. So on the first one, pain and blood taught me a lesson. This time, money and extra time taught me a lesson. Don't over tighten. Some of you are like, maybe it's just called a plumber is the lesson. <laughs> maybe. There were some Christmases also when Linda and I were first married, and we would do this thing. We would go and we would buy everybody really great gifts, right? We loved being generous, and we would bless people, bless our kids with great gifts. And then there was a gift that was waiting for us in January called a credit card report. And, and, and we're looking at that in January, and it's like, you know, th this is a problem. We've got to deal with this, and it took us months to deal with the credit card debt that we had incurred in December, and that's never happened to any of you, right? That's just us, and we didn't like that gift waiting for us in January, and so the pain and the money and the, all of that taught us a lesson that you need to budget your Christmas, you need to think through your Christmas gifts, and you need to stick to that budget so that January isn't so stressful. Amen? Amen? There was a time a vacuum salesman came over to our house. He wanted like $1,000 for this vacuum. It's crazy. And, you know, we're going back and forth and all this kind of stuff, and listen to the sales pitch and everything, and... And Linda and I were not on the same page with the salesman. And here's the thing. We did not end up buying the vacuum. Praise God. <laughs> some, of you, some of you guys bought the vacuum. Some of you bought the full set of encyclopedias, and you're still making monthly payments today. You don't have to raise your hand. It's okay. I get it. But I thank God we didn't have to pay the lesson of debt on that particular thing. But here's the lesson that we did have to pay, is that Linda and I were so kind of against each other on that decision and kind of fighting through it with this other salesperson in the, in the house at the exact same time. It was a brutal experience, and we were not very happy with each other for a few days. We got through the decision, but there was some breakage here. Here's the lesson I learned there through friction, was the helpful thing when it comes to financial decisions is to set a rule for yourself, husbands and wives. We set a rule for ourselves, and we said, you know what, we will always take 24 hours to sleep on a major financial decision. Always. 
We won't make it. I don't care how good the salesman is. I don't care how good the deal is. We will not make the decision unless we can pray about it, we can talk about it, and we can chill the whole thing down. Right? And what we did is we made a rule for ourselves that saved us from future fights. Here's the thing. We learn a lot of lessons in this life, but a lot of the lessons that we learn is through the mentor of misery. Amen? The coach of consequences. The terrible teacher. Right? Like, we can learn through pain. A lot of us, that is the main way. I got to learn the hard way. Ever hear that phrase? And what we're saying is, I've got to stick my poor hand on every hot stove just to find out that it burns. And it's like, you know, there's, there's pain in this life, right? And there's pain that we can't avoid. There's pain that God even wants me to go through because it's good for me. But what about the optional pain? I'd like to not do the optional pain. Amen? So what does God give us? God gives us Instead of the mentor of misery, he gives us biblical mentors. He gives us divine mentors that teach us different lessons. And what I'm going to propose to you here today is that we have the option of how we're going to learn in this life. Will we sit down with God's word and learn? So take Joseph in the book of Genesis. There's a guy named Joseph. He gets sold into slavery, if you know about Joseph. Joseph mentored me. You learn about Joseph. Joseph, I, I, I don't get just like a little tidbit verse that I can put on a bumper sticker from Joseph. What I do is I sit there and I, I learn about his life. I watch him walk with God in the scripture. And lessons start to pour out of his life to me. So there's this time and Joseph is in Potiphar's house and he'd been sold into slavery. And if you remember the story, He's doing really well there, but Potiphar's wife gets sexually attracted to him, and she propositions him. And in that moment, he has a decision to make. And what does he do? Do you know what he does? He runs for it. She reaches out to him. She even grabs his cloak, the scripture says, and he just lets her have it, and he runs out of the house. Here's what I learned Sometimes I can get into a weird Christian place and I think, you know what, when I face temptation, especially sexual temptation, maybe I should stand there and be strong. Nope. Don't stand there and be strong. Run for it. Maybe I should stay there in this really kind of awkward situation where someone has told me that they're attracted to me, but I know that this isn't God's best for me, and maybe I'm going to feel like I've got to stay here and I've got to spare their feelings and have a conversation and say, yeah, I'm kind of attracted to you too, but I know it's the wrong thing to do. Don't have a conversation. Run. <laughs> Don't spare their feelings. Run. Get out. Joseph taught me that. Amen. So I read John the Baptist, and John the Baptist mentored me, taught me some things. As I watched him walk with God and do his ministry, I learned some things I didn't know about how to be a pastor. See, John the Baptist had this really great phrase at one point. He said, you know what? I've got to decrease, and Jesus has got to increase. And, and, and he's like, you know what? It's like a wedding, and Jesus is like the groom, and the church, God's people are like the bride. And he's like, I'm just the best man. He's like, I just stand here, and I'm, I, my job is to make sure everything goes right, make sure I don't lose the rings and all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not the center of attention. I'm off here to the side, planning the party, making sure everything's great. And when he said that, John the Baptist mentored me, taught me as a pastor, you know what? Sometimes we pastors, we think we can be the center of the church universe. Nope. You're not. I'm off to the side. Why? Because there's a relationship trying to be formed between God's people and the Savior. And that's what I should care about. Step off to the side, Josh. That's how pastoring's done. Everything is about that. We prayed for another church plant this morning. Part of the reason is it's important to us not that people be build a relationship with Grace Fellowship Church, but with Jesus Christ. 
no matter what building they're in. We love that, and we rejoice with them this morning. There's a verse here, Psalm 119, 105. Some of you guys know this one. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And I love in that verse, it's kind of talking about direction, right? Like, I need the word of God to tell me which way to go. But the other piece of it is I need a light on my path. Why do I need a light on my path so I don't stumble? Because God wants to protect me from the mentor of consequences. So I got John the Baptist, I got Joseph, and then I got John the Apostle, John the Disciple, who wrote the book of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, this John. And if you've read John, you know that he refers to himself in the gospel as the one who Jesus loved. It sounds cocky, doesn't it? And you're like, why does he say that? It's because he knew what his relationship with Jesus was, and he didn't doubt it, and he was secure in that relationship. Not only Jesus' side, but also his side. And John kind of messes with you, because sometimes we can think that our Christian guilt and doubt is somehow a badge of honor and pleases God. It doesn't. And there are times, right? There are times when we should evaluate our faith. We did two weeks ago at the three chairs. We talked about, like, where are you with that? Like, maybe be honest with yourself because maybe you need to start a relationship with Jesus you haven't started yet. There's a moment to ask those questions. But we're not meant to stay in a place of constantly questioning our relationship with God. John knew who he was. There's this moment in the, uh, at the Last Supper right before Jesus goes to the cross. And the disciples are gathered there and, you know, the bread and the juice and all that kind of stuff. But Jesus says to them, you might know about this moment. It, it happens in Matthew, it happens in Luke, and then in John. And Luke describes it as Jesus says to the disciples, says, hey, listen, one of you is going to betray me. And they all go around the table, and they're like, is it me, Lord? Is it me? John, you read the whole scene in John, he adds the detail that when it comes to him, he says, Lord, who is it? Why does he say, Lord, who is it? Because he knew it wasn't him. He knew who he was. It's like, I'm not betraying you. No way. I'm not that guy. And I love that about John. And John taught me that. You see how people can mentor us from the Bible? They can save us from pain. They can sow deep seeds into our life. Like Noah, some of you guys are reading about Noah right now. Abraham, Moses, right? And Peter, and, and obviously Jesus. Like these, I'm not just reading the Bible to get my little tidbit that I can post on my Instagram story, amen? I'm not just looking for that little phrase. I'm sitting under mentors that God's like, let me give you seven chapters on this one person because I want you to sit down and learn from their life because they're trying to follow me too. And how did this go? And there's some things that you're going to pull off of that story. So be patient with the stories. Can I say that? Be patient with the stories today. Principles before pain. Amen. Okay. Let's talk about manna next. Manna. Do you know what manna is? Heavenly bread that God sent down to his people. So let me give you some context. And if you're a Bible person today, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 16. So go ahead and take out your Bible, take out your smartphone, however you're going to do it. It's also going to be up on screen, but I highly recommend your own Bible. Exodus chapter 16. While you're turning, let me give you a little bit of context to this. So God's people, the Israelites, the Jews, they have come out of Egypt and they were slaves there in Egypt. Do you guys remember that? They're slaves there in Egypt. Moses goes up and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says no. And there's all these like trials and things. And God brings all this stuff against Egypt to, to let his people go. And then finally his people come out of Egypt and everything looks good, right? And then they come up to the Red Sea. And what's the problem? Well, Pharaoh's army's coming up behind him to kill him. And what does God do? God parts the Red Sea. It's this amazing, just fundamental, universe-defying miracle, right? And they walk through on dry land. 
And then God leads them into the desert, if you know the story. And then it's like, well, that's fine, but what are we going to eat in the desert? And they're going to be there for 40 years, by the way. So desert or, or, or food and, and getting good, clean water is an issue. So chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Then the whole community of Israel set out from Elam and journeyed into the wilderness of Sin, between Elam and Mount Sinai. And they arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. Now that's important. There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. Now why is that timing important? They've been a month out of Egypt, which means any food they packed up for their families, it's probably gone. They're getting hungry. Verse 3, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around, pots filled with meat. We ate all the bread that we wanted. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us to death. Do you love it? We're supposed to read those moments. Christians, let's go. We're supposed to read those moments, and we're supposed to laugh. Like, look at these goofballs. God just parted the Red Sea. And it's like, what have you done for me lately? Kind of a thing. Like, this is so silly. Who would do this? And then the Holy Spirit comes in like, you. You. You're just like him. I mean, we, we like, what have you done for me lately? We do that to God all the time. But you just saw the Red Sea part. I know, but that was weeks ago. <laughs> So I get it. But on the other side, they're hungry, right? Okay, next verse. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. And I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. That's big. So it's going to be an amazing miracle. God's going to provide bread from heaven for them. This is how God feeds an entire nation for 40 years while they're in the desert before they get to Canaan. God does not shut off the manna until they hit the edge of the promised land, and then manna shuts off. Read it for yourself. This is how it goes. Next, verse 13. And the next morning, the area around the camp was wet with dew, and when the dew evaporated, there was a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. Um, the Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. They said, what is it? They asked each other. They had no idea what this stuff was, and Moses told them, this is the food that the Lord has given you to eat. So just a quick note before we continue. This manna, this food that they're seeing there, it's all grace. I want you to see it as a picture of grace and God's provision. But grace is such an important word in it because guess what? They're not earning this, are they? They didn't, they didn't like plant the crops and like take care of it and water it. And like here it comes to them and now they can eat. They didn't do anything to get this stuff for them. They're not taking care of animals. They're not slaughtering animals. They're not do doing any of that stuff. God is 100% providing free food for an entire nation every single day. Take that in for a second. But notice, even though God provides the grace 100%, what does he ask them to do? He asks them to gather it. I, I, I say this, just, I'm going to make a small, small note. Some of us struggle with um, free choice. And there's even debates in the church about how much choice do we have and how much does God just make me a Christian? All by his grace, all by his calling, his sovereignty, all that kind of stuff, right? Right? And we'll get weirded out by it because the scripture says that you've done nothing to make yourself a Christian or to earn your place as a Christian. Not by works so that no one can boast, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Not by, not by anything that you have done have you earned your place with Jesus Christ. Everything was done on the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. It was all done on the cross. But we're supposed to surrender. And we're supposed to surrender our life to him. And there's an act and there's a choice that's there. And some of us look at that choice in that moment of surrender and we're like, wait a second, is that a work? Does that, does that mess with my salvation and make, make it to where like I earned it somehow? No. 
You simply gathered up God's grace. That's all you did. And manna is just this beautiful, and, and Scripture's full of beautiful little pictures like this. But God will provide it 100%, and then he'll ask you to take a step to gather his grace into your life. And that's manna right there. Okay, verse 16. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent, and you can see the rule I've got there. Rule for, for manna is you've got to gather your own food. Nobody can do it for you. Next verse, 17. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed. Right? Like, like you got one family goes up there, and they've got an only child at home, right? And then you've got the other guy who's got like 10 strapping, growing boys at home. He gathers a whole lot more. Amen? And, and, and so it's just giving us this little detail and saying, listen, people went out and some of them were more hungry that day than other ones. Some of them had more family at home than other ones did. They didn't all gather the same amount. And that's going to get important later. Gather what you need, not what everybody else gathers. Next, verse 19. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until the morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of it until morning anyway, because of course they did. But by then, it was full of maggots, and it had a terrible smell, and Moses was very angry with them. So the rule is, you got to gather it every day. God built that in. You can't gather for a week. You can't gather, gather for a month every day. Verse 20 to 21, after this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, just like they were supposed to, each family according to its need, and as the sun became hot, the flakes that they had not picked up melted and disappeared. So they didn't even have trash duty. They didn't even have to clean up dinner. And then verse 31, the Israelites called that food manna, and it was like, white cori it was like coriander seed, and it tasted like honey wafers. So it even tasted good. And, and this part, it kind of tells you what... Uh, Manna in its raw form would have tasted like to them, but there's other spots in the scripture, I think it's in the book of Numbers, where it talks about the fact that they would take this coriander seed-like substance that even had a sweet flavor to it, and they would beat it down and work it into a bread and actually bake it. So manna was pretty cool and a picture of God's grace. It's a miracle you cannot make a big deal out of enough in the Old Testament. This was massive for Israelites. Even afterward, they often talked about what God had done in the manna. Um, God even directed them to take some of the manna and put it in a jar. It was in the Ark of the Covenant itself. Manna and bread is a big, big symbol throughout the Old Testament. Even to the point in the New Testament... There's a moment, you might remember, Jesus feeds some people with a few loaves and some fish. And he multiplies it, and he takes care of all these people on a hillside, feeds them miraculously. And it's that moment, as soon as they see that, they connected it to the man in the Old Testament and said, this must be God. And they tried to make him king by force. That's just another little note for you. Okay, let's go back to rule number one. Rule number one with manna is that you've got to gather your own food. Amen? Gather your own food. I find this interesting because gather your own food, it's like, is that really the best way we can organize this thing? Like, if I bring my project management expertise to this particular situation, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying we need professional manna harvesters. We need to get them bags and carts. We need to train them well on how to collect manna in a great way. Get it to all the family. Let's do a whole distribution thing. Right? Like, let's do this right. If my goal is getting calories to every single individual in this nation and getting food into their mouths, if that's the goal, there's a better way than having everybody gather their own. So why does God have everybody gather their own? Because it's not the goal. Like, he wants them fed, sure. But what else is he doing here? He 
He's teaching them. Because if everybody goes and gathers their own, it does a whole bunch of stuff, does it not? Yeah, it teaches them responsibility, keeps that relationship with God, it keeps it individual. It forces them to trust him every day. Everybody has to trust him every day. Everybody has to show up and see the miracle with their own eyes. See, if I did my professional manna gatherers idea, you know what would happen? Is it would have been packaged in cellophane, right, with an expiration date and the whole thing and delivered to people and here's your manna. And don't we do this thing where, like, we get, the, we get the boneless, skinless chicken breast at the store and, like, everything's nice and clean and I don't want to see any red on it like there was ever blood here? Like, separate me from the entire process. And when you do that, there's some things that get lost. And God knows that. It's like, no, you're going to walk out of your tent and you're going to be hungry and you're going to trust me for the miracle every single day. Because that's going to do something to you. And you're going to be wowed at it all over again and realizing I'm providing for your family directly. Mm. I thought we were all going to die just then. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, So you got to gather your own. What's that mean for us? It means pastors can't gather for you. Spiritual leaders can't gather it for you. And and Pastor Ricky did such a great job last week talking about the Golden Corral. Did you catch the Golden Corral? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I cringed when he said it. I felt it. Oh, God, help me. Um, but he, <laughs> he described people going to Golden Corral, the buffet, you know what I mean? It's like, and you're sitting there at the table with the empty plate, and you're sitting there saying, why won't somebody feed me? And he's like, no, the food's right there. It's before you. You have to, you know. And we do that with pastors, don't we? And we do that with Bible teachers, and it can be in your church, it can be online, it can be wherever. It's like, you no, know, you've got to go, go gather the manna for me. No, they don't. Because it's not about getting spiritual calories into your mouth. You come in here today, it's not just about getting you some teaching. It's not about just getting you some inspiration. And it's definitely not about getting you some spiritual entertainment today. Sometimes we go off into the car, we say, how was church today? And what we're really asking ourselves is, how was the entertainment value of church today? And we can't do that. That's not what this is about. I'm not trying to be mean. Just can, can we be real? It's, it's not what it's about. It's about spiritual calories that you had to go to God and gather and bring. And that, that exercise, when you open up your Bible at home and you read it and you're hoping God will, God will bring you the miracle of a word for you, And that you'll feel the Holy Spirit speak to you. You'll see him answer your prayers. Right? Like all that's supposed to be you and him, you and the Savior. And when you go and gather it for yourself, all that stuff, all the trust, all the amazement at his miracle, it all starts to turn on. You got to have it for you. No one can provide it for you. Rule number two, just gather what you need. And this is a weird one. But I want you to see this. This is so important. They just gathered what they needed for their family. And don't get weirded out that that guy gathers more. Don't get weirded out that guy gathers less. When you go to do your time with God, I don't care that your best friend, who's a spiritual rock star, has a stack of commentaries and spends an hour in prayer every single day. Praise God for them. But don't let that intimidate you. Don't don't judge your own relationship with Jesus based on what they're doing. Why? Shouldn't I be inspired? Sure you should be inspired. But you know what often happens to most of us? Is we get weirded out by that. And we think that's the only way it can be done. And when we think it's the only way it can be done. And we can't measure up to it. We get depressed. We get discouraged. We stop. It's not about how much Bible you read. It's about whether or not you have a connection to the Savior that day. That's it. Simplify this thing. 
So there's a reading plan that uh, we've got out in the lobby today. You guys can get access to it. We gave them all away during first service, and they're printing them like crazy next door right now. So they'll be out there when you come out. But it's a, it's a reading plan. There's a picture of it on the screen. There's, there's several pages to it. And what, we, what we've done is we've given you Bible readings every single day for the rest of the year. And what I'd love for us to do as a church is to try this reading plan together. Because I think it's fun to do a, a hard new thing, do it with some other people. Do it with some other people, it's easier. So come and join us on this thing. So you, know, you notice on day one there, you've got Genesis, you've got Psalm, you've got Proverbs, you've got Matthew. The two big readings there are Genesis and Matthew. And Genesis is for sure the scarier stuff. Because you might hit some genealogies and some things you can't pronounce and stuff like that, right? So like maybe you tried that this last week. Like I started on Monday, that was day one. And so today should be day seven, tomorrow is day eight. If you're going to start with us, just start at day eight. But it's like if it gets scary, then don't do the full thing. So, for instance, you might just highlight Matthew 1, 1 through 25 there. And I'm just going to read the Matthew. I'm just going to read about Jesus. Right? Just do that. And keep tracking with us. Do one chapter a day. It took me the other day, I timed it. It took me 18 minutes to read all four of those passages for one of the days. Maybe 18 minutes. That you're like, oh, I could barely last five. You know, you know you. I want you to have a connection with God. And I realize even 30 seconds for some of us is terrifying. And some of that, like, we do need to push through some of it, for sure. And it's hard, and it's like we live in a, a you know, YouTube, you know, super quick video kind of a world, and, and our ADD attention spans are, are really struggle. Like, I'm going to sit in silence with a book? Are you kidding me? Let me do it. Because God wants to come in with that focus and with that silence, and he, he wants you to feast on his word. He's got things to say to you, so, so go there with him. I would say, too, if you already started this with us, and you're like, oh, man, I missed a couple of days, and now I'm trying to catch up, and it's like another debt in your life, don't do that. Ugh. Like, if you miss some days, you give up on it for a week, and then you come back, just join us at the day that we're at. You know, get, let those days go. Don't, don't get caught up in weirdness, right? And don't get caught up in the weird guilt of like, but I feel so bad because I haven't been walking with Jesus the way I know I should have. Just get over it. Receive his forgiveness and like, let's go. Just get started. Like some of you guys are like, a book freaks me out, but if I had an audio book, oh my gosh. Like go and download the YouVersion Bible app. It's on all the platforms. You go to the, like, the NIV, several of them, the NIV's just got a great reader, um, the golden voice, they call him. But anyway, the NIV guy, he's so great. You can just hit play. You're on the commute to work. Get some Bible in. Some of you are like, I got kids running around me, like, constantly. Like, the quiet time, are you kidding me? Hey, do your best. You know what I mean? Trust Jesus. He's got a miracle for you, even in the midst of all of your kids. He's got a miracle for you. Amen? Okay, we'll keep going. Skip the genealogies if you have to. Don't try to pronounce words, all that stuff. Um, next rule is gather it daily. Um, you cannot gather for a week or a month. And, I mean, I've, I've, I've already kind of hit this. It's got to be weekly. Why? Why does it have to be weekly? I'll tell you this. It's got to be weekly, or I'm sorry, it's got to be daily. It's got to be daily because... That's where deep relationship comes from. You can't have a deep relationship with somebody without frequency of connection. Right? You can't say, I want to date you and you're my world and I love you. I'll see you next month. <laughs> like, that doesn't work. Like, we know that. Like, just the number of times that we're connected with each other, you can't get past the need for frequency that leads to intimacy. And God is the same way. Your relationship with God is the same way. He wants you daily because he wants an actual relationship. It's not about learning information. It's not about the Bible quiz that you're going to take later. It's none of that. He wants to connect with you. The other thing is, the other reason that weekly or, or monthly is not enough for you is because the world is not weekly. The world is hammering you daily. 
with junk. It's breathing darkness and lies into your life, depending on your personal relationship with your phone, possibly on an hourly basis. And you've got to combat that. We need the truth of Jesus Christ to come in against that. Amen? Okay, next thing. Here's just really, really practical stuff. I want to encourage you to get a notebook next to your Bible when you read. A notebook, a journal. And we're selling them today out in the lobby at cost. Don't get those. Get your own. Do whatever you want. Some of you might use an app on your phone. I use an app called Day One. It's just a journaling app. Syncs to my devices. Costs a little bit of money. Worth it. I like it. Do You do you. But you need a blank page next to the Bible that you're reading. Why? Because you might just want to read over it. The blank page creates an expectation of God wants to speak something to me. And I'm going to write it there. And it doesn't have to be much. It could be a phrase. But God wants to speak something to me. So I'm, I'm going to suggest something called SOAP to you. Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. And I've done this before. If you've come to Grace for a while, you've heard of SOAP before. So I would just love you to maybe make a, like a 30-day commitment that you're going to do this reading plan with us or part of the reading plan with us, and that you're going to try and soap each of those days. And here's how it works. Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. So I'm going to give you just an example of one of mine from this last week. So first off, this, the scripture that I read was Matthew 4, 44. But Jesus told him, who's him? That's the devil. Jesus had gone out and he was fasting and he was praying in the wilderness. Do you remember that? And he had fasted for a long, long time. And Satan comes to him, of course, and says, why don't you turn some stones into bread? Because I know you're hungry. And he's tempting him. Jesus says, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but they live by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. And as soon as I read that verse, I'm like, man, it's like the Holy Spirit underlined it for me. You ever have that moment? You know, it just popped off the page. Okay, that's... That's what God's trying to speak to me. So that just goes in that scripture. Again, it could be a phrase. You could write more. It's up to you. But put that in that scripture. And then zero, the, the O there is observation. And so this is just like, why did I write this one down? What am I observing? What's happening here? What I saw happening in that verse is that Jesus is treating God's word like essential bread that he's hungry about. And that if he doesn't get that, he won't survive. So I wrote that down. God's word is just as important as bread to Jesus. That's crazy. So God, where are you trying to speak to me? So what's the application? What's for me? And it doesn't have to be anything brilliant. Sometimes, sometimes in that application thing, I'm like, I didn't get anything in the reading today. Okay? Or it's, I was too distracted. I mean, that's, I mean, you ought to see my journal. It's okay. But this day, I need to see God's word as survival for myself I need to make a choice to start to hunger for it. That's what, that's what touched me. And then lastly, the prayer, I turn the application into a short prayer. Father, give me true hunger for your word. Just do what you can. There's something about that blank page while I'm reading God's word. And again, maybe you're just a chapter. And you're like, I can do a chapter. I can do five minutes. I can get through this. And I'm just going to write something small down the expectation that God is speaking to you because it will amaze you. Just like that manna was a daily miracle, it's him speaking to you that will be the miracle. Another one this last week, we were also reading in Genesis this, this last week. Uh, some of you guys are part of this reading plan. We're doing this as a staff. We're doing this as leaders as well. We're doing this each day. So if you got any questions from your reading, you want to email one of us or stop us in the hall and be like, I was confused about that verse. Ask one of us because we're doing this together. But one of them was about Noah. And I love the, the just, did you catch the Noah in the ark? Do you know he was there like a year inside of that ark? I mean, it rained for 40 days. But then the earth was flooded. And he waits almost a year to get back out of that boat. And he doesn't know when it's going to be over. And I'm reading that and all the timing of it and stuff, it just started to pop out to me. And I'm like, oh, that's crazy. Why is it crazy? Because sometimes I wonder, is COVID ever going to be over? And I get wore down. And sometimes I feel like I'm stuck in a boat. 
and I never know what God's plan is going to have next. Anybody feel that? And so I learned some things from Noah. Helped me. Let's talk to you about what some things that I think God is doing in our church. And we got these baptisms next week. Several of you have made decisions to start following Christ. Your walk with God is really starting to go. So we're teaching you how to not just come to church, not just have a faith, but to start to walk with Jesus Christ. That's what these next several weeks is all about. It's all about God's word. And we're talking about it. It's like, it's so exciting because so many of us are going together and, and like we're journaling and we're doing the same readings every single day. It's more fun. Next, we're going to do prayer. So after this series is done, we're going to do four weeks on prayer. You ever have any questions about prayer? Ever have any questions about how does God speak to me? How do I know when he's speaking to me? We're going we're gonna to go after all of that in a series on prayer. And we're not just going to do a series on prayer. We're going to actually pray and fast together as a church. I can't share all of that yet. We're still making those plans. But it's going to be fun. And we're going to do the prayer thing together as well. So there's like this wave kind of thing the Holy Spirit is doing in our church. Man, I hope you jump in. You don't have to jump in on any of this. But I would love it if you jumped in because I think it's going to be a good time. Last verse, Colossians 3.16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. It's my last verse because this verse isn't talking about just getting a little bit of Bible. This verse says, the word of Christ is supposed to dwell in us deeply. And that's what I want for us. I've talked, I've talked most of this message. I've talked most of this message about people who are just starting off with Jesus. Can I address people like me in the room? Maybe you've walked with Jesus for a long time. Maybe you've walked with him before and you used to like, you used to have this kind of daily relationship with him and then life happened, crisis happened and you kind of stopped and I totally get it. Like if I could map out my personal walk with Jesus, like in a historical way, you would see me getting really close to Jesus and then backing off and then getting really close to Jesus again and then really backing off. And it's this constant process of, of revival and so you may have backed off, and I get it. I want grace for you today. I want to communicate grace to you today. You know, the worst thing in the world is when you go to the gym, and then you stop going to the gym, and then you want to go back to the gym, but you don't go back to the gym because the first day back to the gym is going to be the worst day ever. Because you're like, they're all going to look at me, and they're all going to notice I gained weight and all this kind of stuff. I don't, I don't even know where the machines are going to be. You know what I mean? It's just like we, we get in all this weird headspace. Getting back into your walk with Jesus can feel that way if we're honest with ourselves. Just don't let it bug you. I've been there. So this, this last Christmas, I visited home, and I hadn't seen my mom and my sisters since May. <clears throat> and you know you have that experience. Maybe some of you guys had that experience. Like, you go and you like see mom and you see your sisters and you haven't seen them since May. And, and, and you, they keep doing things and you're like, I'm surprised that they did that. I forgot, I forgot they laughed like that. I forgot they looked like this. I forgot this part of their personality. Have you ever done that? And, and what you start to realize is like when I was away from them, I started to like build this other version of them in my mind, in my memory. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just kind of what we do. But this isn't the real them. And then we kind of come back, especially when it's been years. And you kind of come back into their presence again. And all of a sudden you just get hit with all the reality of who they actually are. And you're like, this is, this is what's right. And this is the right person. And this is what I miss. And some of you have been away from Jesus just too long. 
And you got this version over here in your mind, and it's not the real thing. And, and I'm encouraging you, like, come on, come with me. Let's go do this thing together. And you're going you're gonna to go back to that place and you're going to start waking up and you're going to start reading again. You're going to start praying for him to speak to you again. And it's all going to come back. And when it all starts coming back to you, you're going to have a, an incredible time. And there's going to be a joy again, right? There's going to be a passion again. It's going to come into your life. And, and, and what you're going to tell me next Sunday or the Sunday after that is you're going to be like, I missed him been there. No judgment. He's waiting. Amen? Would you guys stand? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much, God, for the people here, the people gathered online. Lord, you're so good to us. I love the way you just, you, you kind of bring your sheep together to worship you, to learn of you. And Jesus, I just pray for a move of God in our church, Lord. I don't want to just do church, Lord. I want to I want to grow and I want to move forward and I want to do new things, Lord. And change is always hard. And God, not only is change hard, Lord, but new habits are maybe the hardest. So we're going to need your grace, Jesus, as we try to do this stuff together. God, would you just come into all the practical stuff? Would you just help us, Lord? Would you be there with us, Lord? I pray for a whole new kind of honeymoon period with all of us, God, where we get excited again. All the joy comes back again. You speak to us just so clearly. Come and change our lives, God. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.